Hi everybody, my name's Sid Jones, and you probably don't know me, but I worked for Treasure Solvers for almost 20 years. I'm one of two people that had the unique distinction of being on hand and on site for the discovery of the Margarita main pile as well as the Atocha main pile. Kane Fisher was the uh, other person that also had that, that distinction as well. At the time, just before the Santa Margarita was found, we had already found portions of the Atocha site out in the uh, quicksands area, the deep sand, and all of the trail that had been found was kind of biased on a southeast to northwest axis. And when the first parts of the margarita were found, well, they kind of were on the same axis too, and we went, well, that makes sense. Uh, both ships sank in the same storm, so they probably were being uh, pushed by the same winds and waves and hence they are parallel tracks. So initially, once we found the main pile of the margarita, we presumed that that trail going off to the northwest from the main pile was probably the actual main track of the wreck. It was very, very important for us to maintain position where we wanted to be. Uh, the boats to maintain position were in the center of a radial of anchor lines. So sometimes we use three or four anchors to, to anchor the boat in the middle and then the anchor lines would go out in different positions and we would winch the boat around within the perimeter of anchors to uh, explore the area. And it was very, very important, not only for excavation purposes, but for locating the divers and where we were actually on the site. So we spent a very, very frustrating uh, three or four days fighting the, the elements out there not having a whole lot of success. Now, which also made my crew a little bit unhappy was that the Virgilona, the other boat that was owned at the time by uh, Trader Salvers, was on the main pile and they had National Geographic photographers on board and were filming the Virgilona crew uh, working on the, or on the Margarita main pile. And obviously there was a little bit of jealousy and uh, they were kind of grumbling under their breath that they wished that they, the geographic photographers would spend some time with us too. But we actually had to spend a lot of our time digging or excavating or searching away from that area uh, because we didn't want to drag into them in case our anchors failed again. So we actually were working well up to the north from where the, uh, the Virgilona and the main pile of the Margarita actually were. Um, the, the day that we're going to start talking about started like the other days uh, that had happened prior in the trip and that our anchors were dragging, we were bending anchor flukes, uh, the weather kicked up and then kept calmed down and we were struggling to, to stay on place, on position. We weren't really finding much, but there was this very, very, very fine trail of ballast once in a while, broken pottery shards, the occasional broken piece of barrel hoop uh, that we would sometimes find. And so we just kept pushing this trail and pushing this trail further and further to the north. Now again, remember that we all thought that the main section of the wreck had gone off to the northwest from the main pile. And here we were uh, hundreds of yards to the north of the main pile and we were still finding little bits and pieces. Now it wasn't a really solid trail. It was very, very, very fine. And we would dig two or three holes and not find anything and uh, then move to the next uh, excavation and maybe find one small piece of ballast. So I felt at the time we were right on the very perimeter of the, of the uh, wreck trail. But because we couldn't get in close to the main pile uh, due to the verge loan of being there, we just continued on pushing in that direction. And just about the time I was getting frustrated enough to say, okay, well, we're going to move the boat. We find one little thing again. I say, okay, next couple of holes, let's see what we find. So typical of the day and the previous days before, one of the stern anchors started dragging. And uh, I sent a diver via our whaler uh, to go to the anchor line that was dragging. And I was hoping he could swim down the anchor line and maybe be able to to wedge the anchor fluke into one of those potholes that I told you about, the solution holes in the, in the bedrock, hoping to hold our position. He barely got under the water, working his way down that anchor line, and all of a sudden he popped up. Now the swordfish is a very, very loud boat. It was very difficult to hear much other than the exhaust noise on that boat. And even though he wasn't that far away from us, maybe uh, 125 feet or so, we couldn't understand what he was yelling about. I presumed that maybe he had some sort of 
medical issue or maybe he had a shark or something uh, that was uh, hassling him. So again, I sent the whaler over to go pick him up because we couldn't get to him. Uh, we were anchored up firmly in our, um, in our anchorage there. And uh, the whaler immediately came back without picking up the diver and reported that he had found a cannon as he was going down the anchor line towards the anchor. So the, the whaler picked up a, uh, a buoy and gave it back to the diver and then we winched the boat over to the position where he was and parked right over the top of this top of the cannon. So pretty amazing. We all went over the side and looked at this thing and there it was, this beautiful, huge bronze gun. The first one found on the Margarita site and it was a very, very important signpost because now we understood that there, our original opinion about where the wreck track act led might be different because that cannon did not move from the point where it actually hit the bottom when the ship originally broke up. So here's a, an important signpost. Obviously, we called the Virgilona, let them know that we uh, found a cannon. They all came over and everybody got a chance to see it. By that time, it was near the end of the day, so we anchored up for the night. The next morning, the National Geographic crew and Don Kincaid and Pat Klein all came over to the Swordfish to uh, not only film the cannon, but to kind of look around in the area that we were currently now working around the cannon. So uh, I set up a search perimeter around the cannon, and during the course of the morning, we started finding other things. And then about uh, 200 foot further to the north of the cannon, uh, we saw which looked like a snow drift. It was actually a sand bank. Uh, sand was pretty rare in this area. As a matter of fact, the cannon was completely sitting on bare bedrock. But just to the north of the cannon, there was a big sand ridge. And as I swam up to the sand ridge, it looked like a stone fence that was partially exposed underneath the, uh, underneath the, uh, the sand. Looking closer, I could see there were cannonballs all fused together. So, I moved the boat again, brought it up right above where the cannonballs were, and we made our first excavation. Well, the first divers that came down, or went down to, to find out what was on the bottom, came up with their wetsuits packed full of silver coins, and they requested uh, buckets, plastic buckets, though, so they could fill them up with coins. In the meantime, Pat Klein, Don Kincaid, and my first mate were swimming off to the side, and they had found a silver bar laying off to the side, partially exposed. And Don and Pat were going to film it being uncovered as they fanned over it. Um, as they fanned, as the trio fanned around the silver bar, suddenly a number of gold chains became exposed. And those gold chains turned out to be 15 gold chains that were looped all around the, the silver bar. And there were other silver bars also found in the area. Uh, pretty amazing to not only see this, but to have them film it at the same time. The other divers were still working underneath the, uh, the blowers of the swordfish, bringing up bucket loads of coins, all while National Geographic was on board. Keep in mind, this is my second trip on this boat, so pretty amazing times. Uh, the, the area came to be known as the Cannonball Clump, and the majority of the gold and the really high-valued jewelry was all found within a perimeter around this particular area. There was a lot of material found there, so it was a very interesting find. And the uh, two pieces of paper that I showed you earlier were actually the receipt from when we brought in the artifacts from the, just that one trip, the last couple of days that we were out on that trip. So despite all of our hardships, we found hundreds of pounds of silver coins, all sorts of gold chains, silver bars, you name it, jewelry, emerald rings, all sorts of great stuff, all in one spot. Now that's your way to start a uh, treasure hunting career. Obviously I was hooked, and uh, there was a photograph taken with me on the back deck of the swordfish, and I looked pretty burned up by the sun and pretty tired, but I still got a big smile on my face, and a lot of those gold chains are hanging around my neck. Uh, a couple weeks later, Pat Klein took a wonderful picture of those same chains on Taffy Fisher uh, behind our temporary uh, Simonton Court headquarters. And uh, that picture looks a lot better. Taffy looked a lot better in a bathing suit than, uh, than I did, uh, and the gold chains look great on her. So uh, uh, I tend to remember the picture of her with the gold chains rather than the ones with me. 
Um, but there are many more finds to come. I hope you enjoyed hearing a little bit about this great discovery on the margarita. Thanks.